You cannot tell the story of black studies without Brandeis and AAAS. As movements for black studies exploded throughout the nation in 1968 and 1969, Brandeis took its place. AAAS continues to stand as one of the oldest black studies departments in the country. Since that time, AAAS and black studies at Brandeis more broadly has laid the foundation, paved the way, and led the charge for a field that continues to perform the critical work of correcting exclusionary and racist models of learning and knowledge production. AAAS students, faculty, and alumni are pioneers engaging in innovative research, asking critical questions, and challenging old ways of thinking. And when I think of black feminist thought, arguably the most dynamic field within black studies, it is fair to say that it would not exist as we know it today without Brandeis. So I am incredibly excited about our next panel. It's my great pleasure to introduce our two moderators, Karina Ray, Associate Professor of African and African American Studies, and Gilberto Rosa, AAAS major and class of 2019. Hello, oh. Hi, hello, hi. Where's Professor Smith? Oh, I just wanted to be able to see you, okay, hi. <laughs> Shout out to Professor Smith. Um, cool, cool, so I'm just gonna be introducing everyone, so I'll start on my left here. Um, Amaris Brown focuses on the relationship between sexuality and memory uh, in 20th and 21st century black experimental literature and performance. Um, she's a third year doctoral student in the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell University. Um, yeah, yeah. Next is Ra Malaika Imhotep. Uh, she's a black feminist writer from Atlanta, Georgia, current, <laughs> uh, currently pursuing a doctoral degree in African diaspora studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, her work tends to the relationship between black femininity, aesthetics, and the performance of labor. Uh, she's the co-convener of the Oakland-based experiential study group, the, the Church of Black Feminist Thought, and a member of their curatorial collective, The Black Aesthetic. Um, next we have uh, Alexandra Thomas. Uh, she's a, come on, come on out. <laughs> Uh, so Ali is a PhD student in African American Studies uh, at, and History of Art at Yale University. Her current research explores African and African diaspora contemporary art and performance, photography and new media, black feminist thought and queer theory. She has worked for and conducted research with uh, the Rose Art Museum, the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi Project, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. <laughs> uh, next is Ruel Rogers. Uh, he's Associate Professor of Political Science at Northwestern University, where he is also affiliated with the Department of African American Studies and the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program. Uh, he earned his PhD in politics from Princeton University and has held fellowships from the Ford Foundation and the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard University. He is the author of the award-winning book, Afro-Caribbean Immigrants and the Politics of Incorporation, Ethnicity, Exception, or Exit, um, published by Cambridge University Press in 2006. Uh, Lori Insaya, it's like, there we go, Insaya Jefferson is the interim director for the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy at UMass Boston and is also the graduate program director for gender leadership and the public, public policy program. She has, held pol she has held faculty and senior scientist positions at the Heller School um, at Brandeis and has served as an affiliate faculty with HSSP, WGS, and AAAS. She's also a research professor at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, where she focuses on the social determinants of black women's health as conditioned by the simultaneous 
intersections between aspects of social difference and identity and forms of systematic oppression at micro and macro levels. Um, Robert Jones uh, was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh, where he matriculated through the segregated public school system. After completing the Yale University Transitional Year Program in New Haven, he went on to earn his BA and MA in history in 1971 and 1975, respectively, from Brandeis. He served as an instructor in the AAAS department between 1975 and 1982, and was the department's acting chairman between 1975 and 1977. So yeah. Welcome, welcome. Oh. That was wonderful, Roberto. I feel like I'm almost redundant in that you could just moderate this thing. You're, you're, you know. um, so we, what, what we wanted to do um, is have a conversation um, about both Brandeis and black studies here, but also Brandeis's um, influence in the development of the field of black studies. And the way that we wanted to kick that off was by um, asking each of you to just reflect on the most influential, in whatever way that you might measure that text that you encountered in a AAAS classroom. No particular order. Yeah. There. All of the mics are live, so whoever wants to go first. Well, you okay. Can go. Okay. Is this working? Yeah. Can people hear me? Um, it's really good to be back here, and I was reflecting on the question. It's a really important one. And when I think about my own intellectual journey, I think AAAS is where I found my intellectual home here at Brandeis. And uh, the text I think that was most influential or transformative for me was um, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Um, I read selections from it. Um, uh, in one of my AAAS classes, and it actually wasn't where you think I might have encountered the text. It was actually in a text on African American literature and fiction uh, that Philip Harper taught way back when. And um, at that time, I was a political science major, and at that time, I was thinking I had a great deal of interest in understanding black politics, but within the confines of the political science department, um, the interest in black politics was seen as either exceptional, exotic, or epiphenomenal, uh, read marginal. And when I encountered that text, I encountered a scholar who pretty much was centering the black political experience to understand the underpinnings of American democracy. And that conveyed a message to me that maybe the most important way to get a sense of how American politics worked is to understand and center the experiences of African Americans and blacks in this country. And that had not occurred to me because most of what I'd read in political science had kept African Americans at the margin, sort of an exotic um, construction in American politics or somehow epiphenomenal. Um, and so, with that book, um, I started to think more carefully about how the experiences of African Americans reveal the truth about the underpinnings of American democracy, both the way it's practiced and the way that there's malpractice in American politics and the functioning of democracy, essentially. And I owe all of that to encountering that text and, and others like it while studying um, African American studies here at Brandeis. I mean, Anyone who's read that text knows that he spends a lot of time talking about the economic and materialist underpinnings of this country. And uh, it sort of, it tells the story of how the American state came to be. And I had learned about the American state, or so I thought, in these classes on American politics within the department, only to discover that African Americans were not at all marginal to that development. They were actually central. And so I think that text, more than any other that I encountered during my undergraduate years here, for me, launched the life of the mind in understanding black politics. And, and it's still a passion for me. So I owe that to that text, for sure. Yeah. Um, wow, I have a, a hopefully succinct two-part answer. Because there's um, two texts. 
one that um, really kind of was defining for my understanding of like where black performance studies could go. Um, and both these texts were, in, were brought into my life um, by the life-changing magic of Dr. Jasmine Johnson. Um, um, and the first was during Politics and Performance of Authenticity, which I took in the fall of my senior year. Um, and we read two chapters from Jana Brown's Babylon Girls, which is on like black female performers and modernity. Um, and there's a chapter called Letting the Flesh Fly about Topsy. And I almost forgot, like I've been doing all this work around like black men performance and like even like specific performance work around the Topsy figure and like I forgot how everything she says in that chapter just really opened up that world for me um, and allowed me to think about kind of engaging with culture, engaging with performance in this really critical and um, not optimistic, but she reads so much freedom and possibility into the figure of Topsy through an understanding of the work of black women performers. Um, that is everything about what I want my work to be able to do. Um, so that's the that's one part of the answer. And then um, I have to confess, and it feels like a very like <laughs> ultimate arena to make this confession, but I TA Black Feminist Thought the following semester um, without having taken the class. Um, so a lot of the, I was being exposed to a lot of the material at the same time I was teaching it. Um, and in that class, of course, um, we had to engage and teach um, Dr. Hortense Spiller's Mama's Baby Papa's Maybe an American Grammar Book. And I was so scared. <laughs> I, I was, I, I had, I couldn't, I couldn't give, I couldn't do it. I, I had this kind of like way that I wasn't, like I couldn't engage it in its fullness. And I had to figure out how to teach it and guide it. And I think since that moment, since that initial really kind of like fraught relationship, the text has like almost like haunted my work, but in a really kind of beautiful and deeply like like Afro-diasporic way of understanding that. Oh, see, I'm nervous. I feel it. Um, but yes, so I think those are my my two two texts that have had just a profound impact on the way that I understand um, the necessity, urgency, and possibility um, of work, of Black studies. Thank you so much. Um, I would say that. Uh, incidents in the life of a slave girl um, is probably uh, the most influential text that I read during my time uh, here, which is a tale of sort of um, told by Harriet Jacobs and uh, her escape to freedom uh, from captivity. And uh, it's a text that was taught in uh, several courses and continues to be influential to the work that I want to do, um, which is sort of thinking about how uh, black women and girls um, emancipate themselves, how they uh, negotiate places of confinement and make them look like possibility. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I, uh, there are so many. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have to choose. Um, <laughs> I think another text that, that continues to be important uh, in my work, um, was also Poman's Child. And, and that text was taught in uh, Professor Abdurrahman's uh, Sex and Race in the American Novel. And um, aside from all of the other work, we uh, Faulkner, uh, James Baldwin, uh, Kate Chopin, um, this text was the first moment where um, I had a problem with, with, a, with a work uh, of fiction that was by a black queer uh, author. And uh, the text sort of, uh, besides sort of working through a series of, you know, psychoanalytic um, problems for black feminist inquiry about uh, mastery and self-possession and uh, sadomasochism and all of these other questions, it just, it made us sort of ask a question about the ways in which black women have been pathologized in their desires. And, uh, you know, that, being in a place of discomfort is is part of being in in black feminist uh, research, <laughs> and I think that those two uh, those two texts uh, continue to be like gifts that keep on giving, and keep on making problems. Um, and so, yeah, th those are those are two texts that were important to me. When I was first encountered with the question, I'm like, wait a minute, 40 years ago, K 
can I remember what I read 40 years ago? And actually, it took me a while, but one book came to mind that was really, really monumental in terms of understanding the ways in which inequities work. And that particular work was How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney. And it was funny because I was actually, I think I was in Wellington's class. And I will have to say, I'm gonna just give a little shout out first for AAAS. I graduated in 19, I think 1980, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't quite sure. And I will have to say that I loved being in AAAS. I mean, I absolutely loved it. I was such that I would run to the library, I think it opened at 8 o'clock or 8.30, but I was like waiting at the door because I just wanted to pull my books out and I just wanted to read. I used to also go to the BU Africana Library on Saturdays and just kind of hang out there. And what was really interesting is um, when I was reading the book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, I remember having to write a paper about it. And you know, I'm a professor now, and I would never accept, and Wellington, you did. It was a, I think it was an 80-page paper I wrote, because I just got like really carried away. And so of course what that meant was that I had to learn later on how to write briefly and succinctly. It took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but what was really um, important about that, particular, um, about that particular text was that it helped me to understand that there is a give and a take. And at the end of the day, what Rodney was trying to say is that the way that Europe developed and became strong economically, socially, and politically was at the expense of Africa. And so as Europe was developing and becoming stronger and better, it was pulling the resources away. And that's why there was the underdevelopment of Africa. And what was so important about that particular book was that it was giving you the alternative story. In other words, it wasn't the stock story in terms of what we understood and what we heard about Africa all the time, and it was their fault that they were the way that they were. And so what that actually brought to me was first of all, it was important to read critical text and also to read text by people of color. And that was something that I didn't have a lot of experience doing before. And learning how to read critical text really was something that stayed with me always. And I said, what is the other way in which we need to look at something? And also what that did in terms of me thinking about works around black women and around black feminism was to say, even when I read something that's an anti-racist text, I'm also gonna read that critically as well. The other thing that Walter Rodney's book did for me was it helped me to th look at and understand that we have to take a root cause analysis in terms of looking at social problems and social challenges. And what we tend to do most likely is that we say, okay, this is why this is the problem, but we really don't look at the real root reasons for it. So when I'm in my classrooms now, I make sure that my students are reading critical text. In addition to that, that they're also at the same time making sure that there's a root cause analysis. So it was a wonderful book, and um, I will also say that there were many books that I read after that that made all the difference, and I was able to look at them differently because I read Walter Rodney's book. So um, I want to give a shout out to people, not necessarily books. Um, I grew up in um, Mississippi. Um, my education was in a segregated school system. Um, and I mean true segregation. All of my teachers were black from kindergarten through uh, 12th grade. And um, they taught black history in the schools. Um, so I learned about um, James Weldon Johnson John Hope Franklin, Lerone Bennett Jr., Harriet Tubman, um, from, from my teachers. Um, so I had a basic grounding in uh, some things about understanding uh, 
uh, some of the black history issues that are still being grappled with today. But the, the, when I came to Brandeis, um, and um, so I was one of the Ford Hall group, you know, established the AAA, helped to establish the AAAS department. I was also one of the first graduates of the AAAS department. Um, I actually graduated in 71 with a degree in AAAS and uh, American history, so I had a double major. Um, two people were instrumental in my formation and I think my approach to understanding society and that's, uh, and they both are um, not here with us. Um, they passed away. Uh, Hussein Adams, uh, one of the um, first chairmen of the department. Um, well, actually it was after Ron Walters. Um, and <clears throat> who died a few years ago. Unfortunately, I did not get a chance to see him prior to uh, his passing. But, uh, and also um, Ernest Wamba, um, some of you may remember Honest Ernest, um, uh, his, his, his uh, given name was Wamba Dia Wamba. Uh, he, he would say that all the time, and I love the alliteration of that, Wamba Dia Wamba. Yeah. <laughs> he was from the Congo, and Wamba Dia Wamba means Wamba son of Wamba. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that, that always resonated with me. Wamba was an intellectual to the nth degree. You could not ask Wamba why is the water in that fountain dropping on the floor without Wamba <laughs> giving you a long history of water that, and, and what it meant in traditional African culture? And, and he would go on and on. But he, he taught me how to look critically at, at issues. And, and, and I would say, and I'm sure for a lot of you at Brandeis, that's what you will take away yes. is the relationship with people. Yes. And you may, you may forget some of the texts that you read, uh, but what you will always remember is the people, um, your professors, and what interests they did or did not take in you. Um, <laughs> and and for, for me, Hussein and Wamba were mentors. Um, they instilled something in me that uh, never goes away. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and my teachers, I still remember my history teacher in high school, Mrs. Watson. And, and that's been almost 60 years. And uh, I still remember what she taught me, but also how she taught me. And that, that is something that carried forward. And, and uh, so people, as opposed to texts, are, are what shaped me. Um, Walter Rodney, for example, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Uh, Hussein introduced that to me um, at, uh, at, in, in one of his classes that I took with him. And I don't know how many of you know, but Walter Rodney was assassinated yes, um, later um, in, in Guyana. Um, so, uh, but he was a revolutionary thinker. Yes. We brought him to Brandeis, actually, yes. and I met him and talked with him. And he was a small, uns unassuming man that, that you would never think would have the power to transform people the way he did. So for me, it was people as opposed to just texts that, that uh, shaped me. Yes. yes. So for me, can everybody hear me? Okay, so for me, there's two texts that are really important, and I think about them every day. One is Kathy Cohen's 1997, Punks, Bulldaggers, and Welfare Queens, The Radical Potential of Queer Politics. The other one is the Kombahi River Collective Statement from 1977. And um, right now, I'm deep in the archives at the Beinecke Library at Yale um, in the Le Lisbeth Tellefsen collection, which is a really understudied collection of black lesbian journals, which includes erotica, visual art, um, letters between Audre Lorde and Barbara Smith. And um, so because of that, I think about Cohen and I think about the Combahee River Collective um, basically every day. 
And both of those texts really introduced me to how short-lived black feminist organizations yeah. really um, stay with you. And it's amazing to me that six years of Kumbahi yielded um, lifetimes of research for people like me. And um, Cohen's work definitely um, taught me that black queer studies and black feminism are really wed to each other in that um, there's a way that queer theory um, is important to black studies, um, kind of no matter what. Yeah. And yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you for invoking those names. Um, I guess to that, like, especially thinking of Cohen and, and a radical potential of queer politics. What do you all imagine the future of black studies? Um, and, I, and I'm also really interested in like people who are in conversation with black study, not necessarily in the departments, like what, what the future of black studies might have on, on your fields too. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I consider black studies to be a life practice, right? Yeah. Um, and one that I was born into, and that is always performed in, in excess of the institution or the institution, the academy. Um, and I think from that standpoint, the future of black studies for me um, is also in excess of the institution. Um, and I think I'm really grateful um, for the sister Janice, who was up here earlier, and just really calling in the power of doing too much, yeah. or doing the most, yeah. doing the most. Um, and recognizing that like that certain type of, of endurance, um, when held with health, right? When held with the consideration for and appreciation of our like well-being, particularly um, as black folks, as black women. Um, I, think, I think doing the most, understanding black studies as the thing that leads me into all different types of like cultural, social, and political production. Um, I feel like the future of black studies, um, at least in my mind and heart, is about the ways that, that all this knowledge, all these texts, all these conversations, all these people um, are, are brought back from whence they came, right? Yeah. Taken back to the people to be like rhetorical, you know? Um, but thinking about what does it mean for us to develop black studies practices that aren't dependent on institutional support or funding? Yeah. Um, like what does it mean to, to like literally like take the text to your people? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I've been like trying to start doing that, some of that work with the Church of Black Feminist Thought. Like what does it look like to convene people monthly around black women thinkers and artists and scholars and just say, we're going to sit in this room and talk about it. We're going to break down quotes. You ain't even got to read it. We're going we gonna to do this together. Um, we're going to be in that work together. Um, because I, don't, I think there's also kind of like this like um, anti-intellectual impulse that sometimes movement spaces have. And I don't think that's it either. So I think there's a way that for me like Black studies is like this kind of radical commitment um, to a, an, an, an accessibility to um, a community accountability um, to like bringing all the things that we're that we're gifted or that we steal from the academy and redistributing them. Um, so I'm, I hope that the future or that my part in actualizing that future um, is in developing those muscles of redistribution. It's a great question, and uh, I mean, I can't see into the future, obviously, I mean, so I feel like my answer will necessarily be biased toward my own discipline and the kinds of questions I think about, but in hearing Professor Davis talk yesterday about the destabilization of the nation state and how people think about that political <laughs> construct, I was thinking that I think it's really important for black studies, AAAS, to be at the center of those conversations, um, to look to what, to see what the experiences of blacks uh, around the globe really can teach us about how populations respond to those kinds of changes when they're under assault or actually participating in those as well. And um, I've been thinking a lot lately about how blacks in this country build political consensus because something that's been bugging me a lot in the recent coverage of the 2020 election, the horse race style coverage, is the constant bandying about of the black vote 
at, without a real sort of complicated account of who represents the black vote, who is the black vote, who are we talking about, which black voters are we talking about. And I think if you look to black studies, there are some very sophisticated, rigorous treatments of that question specifically. I mean, in my own work, sort of looking at how African Americans respond to demographic change, immigration specifically, and also uh, disaggregating the black vote, right? Uh, I mean, uh, you talked about it yesterday, Chad, right? this sort of sense of a kind of a homogenization of the black experience. And I see a lot of the coverage lapsing back into that. They might make a nod to black women specifically, and, but it could be complicated even further. I mean, there's class, there's colorism, there's gender, there's culture. And I think that's a useful pathway, at least for African American studies to lead the way in the conversations about what's happening to the, the, the nation, nation state. And also, what the experiences of African Americans or blacks in this country can tell us about the challenges of building a political consensus, that it can't be taken for granted. It requires work, it's struggle. Um, secondary marginalization happens. I'm thinking of Kathy Cohen's work and who gets marginalized and who gets to speak as to what black interests are and what are the biases embedded in that process. I think that's an important frontier uh, for black studies and where black studies can really lead the conversation that's happening across the globe about that. One of the things that I hope um, black studies never does is um, focus on the trees and not the forest. Um, one of the things that I love about black studies is that it has developed expertise um, insight into things that we never thought about back in 1970 or 71. You know, the whole issue of black feminism, um, you know, gender uh, studies, transgender. I mean, there are things that have, that have, that have evolved um, in society that have impacted us, and we've had an opportunity to embrace them, analyze them, and look at them. But at the end of the day, there is racism, which holds down all of us. Um, I have three daughters, and um, they they are out working, and you know they're very strong and have a lot of personality and and um, drive. And yet, at the end of the day, they talk to me about the racist policies behavior that they encounter uh, daily. Um, my youngest daughter uh, is an attorney in um, Philadelphia, and she she's recently was hired at FEMA. So, but her, her um, focus was private practice. She wanted to do business law. And um, she worked in three different private firms. And her recent, most recent experience was so negative that she said, I, I just can't take it anymore. I, I, I want um, a, a, a career that allows me some personal freedom and, and, um, and you know, some stability. Because in private practice, it's all about the billing, right? If you don't bill enough hours, you know, you're not going anywhere. You're not going to make partner. You're not, you know, you don't. You know, they call you in and say, hey, you didn't do 100 hours of, of billing this week. Uh, you need to get that up. But what she saw, white females were brought into the office and given guidance in terms of how to keep their billing up. And she was sort of thrown to the side and said, you got to do it on your own. She did not get the mentoring. Uh, and this is in a firm that professes to have diversity, blah, 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 you know. But on a, on a personal level, in terms of how people actually act towards her and toward versus how they react and act towards white females coming into the business, there is this persistent racism. 
Um, and so at the end of the day, black people and people of color in this country encounter that racism. And if you look at Boston, for example, there are very few, I mean, despite all of the big firms and, and uh, you know, powerful legal firms, how many black partners are there in these firms? It's woefully inadequate, okay? So at the end of the day, don't forget the forest in your pursuit of the truth. Well, as I'm listening to you, and I'm listening to your story about um, black women, and clearly everything you said, I heard and I feel, and it's my life. Um, so one of the things that when I think about black studies, I think a lot of people aren't thinking about this, but it gets back to what you're saying. How do we even consider and think about self-care because many of us are in pain, many of, us have, many of us are hurting, many of us are angry. Now that doesn't mean that at the same time that we're still, some of us are up for the fight, some of us aren't even up for the fight anymore because we're just too damn tired. And so you might say, well, you know, what the heck does this have to do with black studies? I think it has everything to do with black studies because if we don't have the energy, if we don't have the wherewithal, if we don't have what we need inside of us spiritually, emotionally, nor physically, then we can't do the work that needs to be done. Um, I come out of a um, tradition and my education also connects to health and health care. And I haven't really heard much this weekend around thinking about health and health care and how do we take care of ourselves as a community and also as a community, as a culture, and also at the same time move the structures forward that need to be also doing the work that needs to be done. And so one of the things I think is important in a black studies program and other programs where we're working with students of color is that we make sure that whatever we're doing, that we're taking care of them. But at the same time, we as faculty, we as staff have to also be taken care of. And I know through Ford Hall, we all know about what we're talking about here. And so how do we make sure that in these particular departments, in these programs, that's what's, what's part of that is that we're making sure that not just the minds are being taken care of, but also the souls, and that students and faculty and others don't become discouraged because we have to all be in this to make it happen. Yeah, I will go next because I'm going to talk about soul work. Um, it, feels like a, a sort of spiritual coincidence that the first text or one of the first texts that I ever read in black study with Professor Williams was The Souls of Black Folk, written by W.E.B. Du Bois. And currently in my uh, third year at Cornell, um, I'm lucky enough to be in class with Professor Spillers, where right now we're working through a close reading of The Souls of Black Folk. And in this text, um, as some of you might know, um, you know, one of the, the questions that is supposed to stick, uh, not just with black study in, uh, you know, in theory, but in soul work and in spirit work is, you know, what does it feel to be a problem? And uh, the way that I see black study moving into the future is it's a question that's also about our, our commitments to our souls and to our spirits and um, also commitments to wellness, but also what does it mean to, to live in discomfort? Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the moment that we begin to start thinking, or at least I've begun to start thinking that black study is something, or even black feminist study, is something that we can master or that we can own, is the moment that it sort of fails us. And um, as I sort of step into uh, a sort of political identity 
and commitment of being an instructor is, um, has made me sort of reevaluate those texts that now I've been, I've been sitting with and revisiting over the course of four years and, or more. And so, you know, I guess the questions that I, I have more questions for black studies than I have answers. And it's, you know, t to what degree are we, are we willing to live in discomfort? To what degree are we willing to, you know, ask about the price of freedom? Um, to what degree are we willing to sort of um, suggest that freedom is this unfinished project? Um, and so these are, the, these are sort of the questions that I want to pull into my classrooms. These are the questions that I want to facilitate. And I, I, I can't say that there are answers to them. Um, but yeah, away, away, from, away, from master, away from mastery and ownership towards redistribution, um, towards being a problem. Uh, <laughs> continuing to be a problem, yes. Um, So to answer like the second part of Gilberto's question about the future of black studies in our own fields. Um, so my undergraduate training at Brandeis was in women's studies and AAAS. So I had a really um, just completely interdisciplinary training. But now at Yale, African American studies doesn't stand alone. So you have to be completely joint with another department. I, have to, I happen to be history of art, which is probably a couple decades behind everybody else in the humanities. And um, also the first black woman graduate student in about six or seven years. So um, I think a lot about um, a future in black studies in which um, we're not only measured by our ability to be joined in another department. And um, it's really difficult. I remember often um, a moment in Professor Smith, one of her courses, where she wrote Hegel on the board and circled it and talked about Hegel's views on Africa. And I think about that all the time after reading 300 pages of Hegel in a week um, and then talking about Hegel for hours and hours in the art history department without ever talking about um, Salah Hassan or Kobeta Mercer and all these um, other great black arts folks. And um, yeah, I think that I want to see a black studies that um, we're not forced, I guess, to think that Foucault is more important than Patricia Hill Collins. And um, a way that my interdisciplinary training should be beneficial to me as opposed to um, forcing me to kind of make an intervention into another field that I might not necess necessarily want to make. Oh. So I think the question that, well, I wanted to just make an observation, which is that, um, as you were saying, Bob, that you were part of the first graduating AAAS cohort, and you are graduating this year, and so we literally have the full spectrum uh, represented on this stage, and I just wanted to make that, that observation, because I think that it's just another wonderful thing to come out um, of, of this weekend of collective gathering. It's really beautiful. So I think the question that I wanted to, to ask, and probably before we throw it um, open, and I'd, I'd also just love to hear from the audience too as well, uh, um, to reflect on any number of the questions that we've asked the panelists here, but I think my sort of last question, um, and I think some of you have already gotten to that in terms of thinking about like what, what is the, the kind of difficult part of, so, so oftentimes when we, I think when we're asked to envision the future, it is um, in an area where there's already some movement or direction towards it, right? So it makes it possible to imagine that. So what are the, what are the areas for us that our current sort of institutional, disciplinary, and even sometimes interdisciplinary, we talk a lot about interdisciplinarity, but that has its own, sometimes its own inbuilt kinds of limitations because we still live in institutions that are really disciplinarily oriented. 
So what are the, what are the questions for black studies and the future directions that we literally have to kind of um, sort of decolonize our contemporary thinking to even imagine, right? To what are the questions that we, we need to be asking um, that, that we maybe don't even have the language for right now? Which is not to ask you to do the impossible, in a, in a way I think I am, but like it's an invitation to kind of think like what are the, what's the really difficult path to imagine, or what's the what's the what are the areas um, of growth that we haven't even yet to to sort of begin to think about, right? And they're possible. We know that because, you know, black studies 40, 50 years ago would not have imagined the kinds of frontiers that we're at now, right? So this this does happen, and it will happen, and so it's a kind of invitation to think without boundaries in this moment. <laughs> like black studies in your wildest imagination. Like if you didn't have to think in, 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 in ways that were constrained. Yes? I think I got, I think I got a little some, some, <laughs> maybe. Um, so I'm, I'm having so many thoughts right now. Uh, but I think what feels most urgent um, is something that I've been reckoning with both in my kind of like intellectual curiosity and in my like developing art practice um, are like what are ways for us through black studies to um, uh, the language, right? I'm like, what are the words? Um, but like how do we get out of this bind between like pessimism, optimism, like Afterlife did it like how do we how do we really get through our history? How do we think with the ways that our bodies are marked? Um, think through the ways that our navigations of society, our navigations of capital are marked. How do we really think through them and all their like messiness and all their beautifulness and all their ugliness to glimpse and get moments of freedom even when they don't feel good, you know? Yeah. And I think like I don't even know if um, like how to sum it in like a, a like concise way, but I want, I want for there to be a way for us to even reckon with the fact that all this beautiful work in black studies, um, even like my, if I were to just think about my own kind of like intellectual training and growth at Brandeis was also accompanied by like devastating depression, yeah. right? And like all different types of, of traumas and like, like, like sexual trauma and things that like there was no space for me as a black woman active on this campus to talk about at the time, right? And this is happening as I'm TAing black feminist thought, yeah. right? And so it's like, I want black studies um, to be able to hold all of itself, yeah. right? I want black studies to really, truly, and honestly be able to like, to hold like the, the lows and the highs and, and not like in a simple way, like if like uh, the language isn't serving me in the way I want it to right now. Um, but I'm just like, I really want, I really want it for, for it to not feel taboo for me to say what I just said, right? I want it to be like, no, part of my black studies practice was navigating mental health crises, right. Right. right? Like part of learning black studies, part of learning black feminism for me was like learning myself as a survivor, right? And like even sharing like stories of trauma with my folks, right? That was part of, of how I enacted or how I got close to or how I saw myself as free through those really uncomfortable moments. Um, and I think that there's a way that we, we do a lot of like running and hiding and fleeing from, from things that other folks see as ugly, yeah. right? Even on some silly shit, like when even thinking about like the topsy figure, right? Or thinking about caricatures and minstrelsy, like we do a lot of running and hiding and like, like oh no, like don't, don't do that in public. Dirty laundry discourse, all that stuff, right? And I feel like for me, like the black studies of my wildest dreams, like one, doesn't exist inside the academy, um, but two, also like, like can hold, can hold its whole self. I just want to say amen to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that that's really well put, and I think it um, can be married with what I'm thinking about and sort of what black studies spaces represent. I mean, a frustration of mine, I know at Northwestern where I teach, is 
I, I've always thought about um, African American studies or black studies as a place where the impossible is possible, as you put it, where you can imagine alternatives. And oftentimes, you find that even black studies spaces get colonized, particularly when it comes to methods and practices. And so we talk about interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity, but oftentimes you see biases show up in the kinds of methods that are privileged or that have primacy in particular intellectual spaces. And if we can imagine an intellectual space where that kind of confessional praxis is married with experimental methods, as I was talking about with Amber, and interviews and biography and so on and so forth, uh, and on and on and on, but it, it's really hard to pull that off obviously, because people have stakes in different methods, right? And, and, and replicate, you know, and so, I mean, that kind of decolonization, it seems to me, that kind of intellectual decolonization is probably most important when I think about, uh, you know, sort of a black studies for the next millennium, actually, to think about how we can make black studies a space where Multitudes can exist, both in terms of the topics and the questions, I mean, that kind of epistemology, but also the methods and what counts as valid intellectual praxis, you know? I think that's what I envision for the, the next millennium for black studies, actually. I just wanted to say that this weekend has been wonderful for me to hear the language that you've created. Um, uh, I, um, as I said, you know, you're aware that I taught for uh, almost 10 years at Brandeis. Actually, I started actually teaching um, as a TA and actually uh, Hussein empowered me to actually teach you know, while I was supposed to be a TA. Uh, but I actually uh, taught. So I started teaching in uh, 1971 and during my senior year, actually. And um, so by 81, 82, I had taught for a decade. It was 10 years. And I hit the wall. It's like, wham. <laughs> I don't know what I can do with this anymore. Um, how, do I, how do I take what I've learned and relate it to something real? Yeah. And um, so I was in the middle of my thesis, and I just sort of walked away from it. And I went to um, the city, well, I, I lived in Boston. But what happened in the city is uh, they elected uh, the first uh, black city councilor, and he became the first black president of the Boston City Council, Bruce Bowling, mm -hmm. who, who has since passed away. Um, and I said, I have all this theory. I, wanna, I want to see how you can put this in practice. And I actually went to volunteer to work for him um, as his, um, on his staff. And actually, he said, we pay people for this stuff. I said, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so I, I went to work for him and um, had a, uh, my first real taste of politics, uh, which is um, at the end of the day, um, not pretty. Um, and especially in this country, uh, it's all about money. Because if you don't, if you aren't able to be elected, then you can do nothing. So, um, and then unfortunately, Boston City Council, you run every two years. So that means you're in a constant state of fundraising. You are raising money all the time. Um, so, uh, I got kind of burnt out after two years. And, and I said, well, where is it that I can go that I think maybe have some impact? And I became involved in urban redevelopment and uh, affordable housing development in the city of Boston. And, I, and then I spent 30 wonderful years doing that. Um, but what I saw uh, even doing that and the, you know, the things, the projects that I hit did, I can walk around the city point to and I admire them and I have taken my daughters to see my work and say this, this was a hole in the ground, this was a burnt out uh, building, now there are 40 units and people can now live here 
at an affordable level. But at the same time, the city was changing tremendously. Um, those of you who live in Boston and who've been there for a while, remember during the 70s, the South End was predominantly Latino and black. It is not anymore. There are few projects that now uh, maintain a black and Latino presence in the South End uh, that are not there anymore. We've lost it. So what I want to say is hopefully moving forward, um, black studies can marry theory and practice to make life better mm -hmm. for black people. Um, and we're going to have to do some soul searching and ask some hard questions. For example, I went to Barbados, spent a week there, um, wonderful vacation, wonderful people. What I found out in Barbados, they're called the amputation capital of the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah. They have one of the yeah. highest yeah. diabetic rates of uh, per capita in the Caribbean. Um, the diet has changed in such a negative way that the people are suffering. They're literally killing themselves by, by what they eat. So we've, we've got to find a way to marry what we've learned about health, health care, what it takes to have a, a healthy body as well as a spirit and, and, and effect positive change. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is survive and replicate ourselves and, and have people who are going to live healthy for generations. And right now, there's a lot of things, negative things that are happening in our culture that uh, are, are uh, turning us the other way. Um, as I was listening to this question, two things kept swirling around in my mind. Um, one related to children and young people. And as I was listening to this audience this weekend, I heard a lot of young people and some of others who weren't young people talk about when the light bulb went off for them. You know, what black studies, African American studies um, brought to them. But I feel like why do we need to wait until we're 18, 19, 20, and 21 for the light bulb to go off. It, it, it seems to me that why can't we get down and dirty in kindergarten, right? And some of that can happen at home, and some of it can happen in the community, but some of it can happen in schools too. And so if we have all this great knowledge, can't we take it down to these other levels and when I say down, I don't mean down like down, but actually down is up. Mm -hmm. And so how can we in black studies departments find a way to actually partner with elementary schools, nursery schools, churches, other types of community settings, um, parents groups? Um, because I think that the students will come to college much stronger. They'll be equipped and they'll be easier and quicker to sort of say, okay, now I need to say something. Now I need to do something. Because it's too much to happen when you could be focusing more on your, on your education. Um, so that's one. The other one is that, um, you know, I've worked in politics and policy for a number of years. And when I finished my PhD at, at, at the Heller School, you know, I thought maybe I know something now because I got my PhD. And I had been doing a lot of studying, you know, using an intersectional frame. And I kept thinking about, you know, how do we influence intersectionality into politics and policy? I got up on Capitol Hill and I was working for the Congressional Black Caucus. And it was no easy way to actually take what I had learned, it gets back to your point, take what I learned and actually make it happen in the real world. And that doesn't mean it hasn't, because I've seen it happen in different places, but it doesn't, it does not happen enough at all. And so again, how can, so what I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about when we're getting a little bit more radical, we're getting a little bit more progressive. And I, it's really interesting, because I ask my students in my class, okay, your assignment is, you've got a middle of the road, white male as your boss. 
and you have an intersectional framework and you have a pretty radical way of thinking about things, how do you get that particular person to first of all see your view, see your value, and then make it happen? And it's one thing to be able to do that in the classroom because the students can come up with it and it works really well. But what I'd like to know is how do we then take that beautiful exercise and it happened and make it really happen because that's where the change is going to be. Um, yeah, so if no one has anything else to say, we want to open it up for a conversation, um, especially y current AAAS students, like all of y'all right here, like, just come, let's open this up, let's chat. <laughs> Hello. First, I want to say thank you for you all's insight. It was very helpful, and thank you for everything. Um, so my question is, um, so while reading and studying various AAAS giants and scholars in the field, how did you train yourself to accept, and, to accept the contradictions and flaws that are inherent in the works of a lot of your favorite like scholars? Like, how do you accept W.E.B. Du Bois and C.R.L. James and the likes, but also recognize that they silence women like Ida B. Wells and Anna Julia Cooper? And like, how did you employ Marxist theory while also realizing it doesn't provide a framework for black people? Like, how did you struggle with those contradictions? Thank you. Oh, can we, can we take like two more? Um, so we can like answer them all at it. Yeah, oh, from over there and then over there. This was just more to the point about the operationalization of black studies and the future of black studies. Um, I graduated from AAAS in 2002. Um, I did not go on to get a PhD. I actually worked um, in academia, working with students. I do a lot of college transition. So all you um, recent alum who are like, what am I supposed to do? Come talk to me. Okay. Um, but the point about like skills and those things, what I find interesting is oftentimes when I talk about what I do, how I do it, I do draw on a framework that comes from like studying interdisciplinary studies like AAAS. But when you bring that to the table with folks like yourselves, I'm oftentimes criticized for being anti-intellectual because it's like, oh, well, what about this? It's like, these are all very valid things. However, to your point, people have to live in the real world. And we have to think about what, how does this translate? How do the identity politics that are very theoretical translate into the real world. And so my question for you is, how do you have that conversation without that tendency, or how do we manage that tendency toward the criticism of anti-intellectualism? Um, education is very important. Being thoughtful is very important. But when you step out into the world where you are dealing with that mediocre white boss, or you're in a room full of folks, and you're trying to get them to understand why, no, it's not okay just to talk about gender and STEM, that you have to talk about race and class too. That's a different conversation. Okay, um, so a little background. I just started here. So my frame of reference is all high school. Um, my best friend and I like raised hell at Board of Ed meetings, so this really has to do with the last question. Um, what would you like for, like, we actually have some ability to make change. So what, where should I start? Um, my friend, the one who goes with me, wrote an article about um, can black be beautiful? And she wrote it addressing really, really difficult topics and then saying yes, like all forms, like we can all be beautiful. And then she got suspended for it because she quoted someone who said, I would never date a black girl. Um, and so with that frame, like with that kind of um, audacity to say the hard things, like where can we start when I go back from break and go to the Board of Ed meetings and like bring up all of these things because we leave them as part of our history and then just drop them and then move to college and then explore ourselves. How can we go back and hold them accountable for the things um, that have happened and how do we move forward in growing from them? Oh, okay, it is on. 
Um, to the first question, you asked, you asked, how do we, how do we sort of hold all of the sort of complex and contradictory arguments of like political thinkers and social theorists before our time? And the the way that I think about that is that I I'm a contradiction, right? I live in contradiction, and in that way, that's this is part of what canons are for. They're made to be disrupted and to be reassessed and reevaluated. And so for, for that reason, I, you know, there's, uh, there's a way in which I'm, I'm thinking about if, if we live in these contradictions, why can't we install these new ways of, you know, inventing ourselves and self-fashioning and all of these other things? So that's how I would answer that. I just want to like tack on um, that I think there's something about, or something I find myself telling students often um, is that like you're like you said you're you're a contradiction. Like you're allowed to apprehend like black cultural material, whether it's like a music video or a song, and recognize everything that's wrong with it. But you don't have to write me a paper that tells me like it's the worst song in the world when you know that's your favorite song, you know. <laughs> and so I think <laughs> there's a way that we have to be in this practice of like understanding the very kind of like just the reality of, of, of doing different things, not saying the right thing all the time, and recognizing that these texts that, we, that are in our canon, um, these folks who are our giants and our geniuses and our ancestors and our elders, like they, all, they are also, like there's a, there's a human underneath it, right? There's, there's, a, there's a, a person who can make new decisions, who can change their mind. Um, so you, and this is also on that divestment from mastery thing, right? Like why, why assume that they've mastered it? Why assume that I have to master them pretending to master? You know, like why not just allow for it to be a little bit more unsettled than that? And why can't that be the productive space that we write from? I mean, pretty much what they said. Um, I don't have much to add to what they said, except um, your last point about um, not necessarily feeling compelled to savage that, you know, it is your favorite song. I think that's an invitation to think of yourself as offering an internal critique when you recognize your own contradictions, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's not just about criticism where it's about sort of sharp, having these razor sharp critical skills. It's also about constructive engagement with the work, right? And that requires you to find a way to develop an internal critique, right? Put yourself in their contradictions, recognizing that you have your own. And I think that's where you start to do that work and you become a part of that intellectual conversation, if you will, rather than operating outside of it, right? And, and, and throwing darts at it, recognizing that you can mount an internal critique, yeah. recognizing your own contradictions and theirs at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So we have about five more minutes, so I don't know if you want to take um, a few more responses, perhaps to the question about oh, yeah. No, I, I just wanted to, to respond to, to the, um, not necessarily anti-intellectualism, but holding the contradictions um, together. Unfortunately, it, it's, it, as Du Bois and most of our, you know, critical thinkers have indicated, there's a duality about being black in this society. And it, it hasn't changed, and it's going to stay there. So you can, you can read Marx, and you know it doesn't apply to us, or that is that racism trumps, trumps, <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of theory that, that in, 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 in theory, some of these things would, should work wonderfully, but our experience and our history shows that ultimately race has triumphed over everything. So, I mean, it, it, so we can look back at Paul Robeson clinging to communism as a solution for, you know, the suffering that black people uh, encountered. And he saw that, that communism, felt that communism would be the salvation for black people. 
But I, I think we could posit that if this was a communist society and it stayed um, with white people in control, we would suffer, okay? So, I mean, I think we, we, we walk around with this, we're living contradictions in the fact that today we can live and breathe and do many things that our parents couldn't do and, and that maybe 30, 40% of our contemporaries can't do. I mean, we have the luxury of being at Brandeis for four years and you're thinking and you're talking and, and you're doing things that, you know, other, while other people are uh, trying to feed themselves. That's a contradiction. We live with it. You got, you got to accept it and move on. Uh, hopefully you can bring that to your life afterwards and hopefully try to close some of the contradictions. But ultimately, ultimately you know, there are contradictions that will never be resolved. Can I? Um, so I want to try to offer something that might speak to both the question about, like, what do we do? And also um, this thing about, like, frameworks perspective, like, in, in translation, I think, is what I gather. Um, and so for me, what I've found and try to practice is just always being clear, um, always like leading with care, always knowing what my intention is and never compromising my integrity in any room, right? So like, for me, it's like, like I can't lie and be like, I'm not a PhD student, right? So sometimes when I show up at the table, like that's who I am, that's where my language is. But there are also like multitudes, contradictions, right? And I think for me, part of my commitment to personal integrity and facing these kind of uncomfortable, in, uncomfortable conversations or facing um, this, this task of translation, whether that's with kind of like the, the, the figure of the white boss or like with, like the, with my folks, right? I think there's a way that just com committing to a personal sense of integrity, and I, I'm, I'm sorry if this isn't useful. I feel like, <laughs> I don't even know. Um, but I just feel like understanding what, what my intended impact is always and having some clarity about the work that I intend to do when I open my mouth is what I let lead me, and, and what I let guide the way I decide to transfer, like, um, you know, uh, uh, ooh, a lot. And I think as far as like what to do and like change and, and facing different types of like, again, discomfort in this work, I feel like knowing your intention and being grounded in a sense of integrity is where you get your answers to. Like, I don't know if there's like a roadmap or there's not like a checklist of things that I have personally of like next stops on the list, but I think when you're grounded um, by a, a, a personal sense of purpose that's co connected to like the collective function that you serve, like that's what that's where the answers come. That's where the the actions come from.